Hello everybody, I think it's pretty fair to say that the worlds of car and celebrity have been intertwined as long as we've had cars and celebrities. One of my favourite things of an evening is popping onto eBay and seeing what cars I can find that have previously had famous owners. If you'd like to have a go at this, I recommend you start with the Mercedes-Benz S600. I'm not exactly sure why, but possibly it's the combination of opulent luxury along with criminal depreciation that means those cars are almost exclusively owned by celebrities. And so at various points I've seen Elton John's S-Class up for sale, Simon Cowell's S-Class up for sale, and nearly always these cars are accompanied with a sort of half blurry paparazzi picture of a car in the background that might be the one that you're after. And if you happen to have a story of a celebrity owned car that maybe you have had or thought about buying, I'd love you to hit the comment section and share it with everybody because that is the topic of today's video. For I am driving a Land Rover Range Rover L322, previously a member of the Royal Fleet. And because I view these things with a large degree of trepidation, when its owner Ben emailed me and said, James, would you like to drive an ex-Royal Range Rover? I responded back with something along the lines of, um, yeah, sure, lovely, but uh, what makes you think it's a real Royal Range Rover? And then he responded with this picture. So I think it's fair to say this really is a genuine Royal Range Rover. More than that, it is a virtual certainty that at one point in the past, in the back, and possibly even the front, this car has seen the presence of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. And I'm not often that excited about celebrities in general, particularly when it comes to cars. But today is a little bit different, because this is quite cool. What actually makes it different though? Well, stay tuned to find out. Now, as it happens, this car was actually purchased without any idea whatsoever of its illustrious past. Its owner, Ben, like myself, is a bit of a car fanatic, and he's had quite a few of them. Because he got a head start on me, he's a little bit further ahead, and this was number 100, for which he wanted something quite special. As a fan of luxury cars and the odd 4x4, he decided that a Range Rover would be a good shout. So, picked this up about 18 months ago and was very, very happy with it. It's a fine specification car, a 2011 TDV8 with a set of keys inside that is the source of the noise you might be hearing. The keys were not Range Rover fitted, they're just his. But to go alongside with the gorgeous colour combination, it's a Vogue SE. The Vogue SE bit being the trim. In other words, it's a very high level, high specification car to begin with, and the TDV8 bit means that for this model year, it has the Ford derived 4.4 litre twin turbo V8 diesel that I think is just about the perfect engine for this car. In fact, as engine and car combinations go, I think you'd struggle to find better. Though it may be a two ton plus car, the engine makes a healthy 313 horsepower and a frankly rude 516 pound foot of torque. That's 700 newton meters. Naturally, you have the classic Land Rover all wheel drive system with its many configurable modes down here. And new for 2011, you have the eight speed ZF automatic gearbox with the little rotary knob that rises out of the dash, as you'd have seen in many other Land Rover and Jaguar products of the day. Just in case you're unfamiliar with Range Rover model designations, and I would forgive you entirely for that because they're very confusing, this is the car produced from roughly 2001 or so till 2012. It's not the previous generation Range Rover anymore, as the fifth gen has now landed, it's instead the third. It took over from the generally unloved P38 and was followed by the L405, which I still consider sort of the current car, despite the fact it's not. In any case, the L322 appears to be experiencing a mini renaissance on account of two very popular fans, Harry Metcalf and Jeremy Clarkson, both of whom I believe rate it over the later L405. 
and that is one of the many reasons that Ben picked up one of these. They also happen to be an excellent value car, with examples starting now from just a few thousand pounds. The P38 historically was the cheap way into a Range Rover and before it the Classic, but now they have become rare enough and old enough that people are willing to pay more for one of those than an early one of these. On account of the fact that these cars were built during a period where Land Rover was the centerpiece of a game of corporate hot potato, they did evolve quite a bit over the years. This is the reason that during their production run, you could buy them with engines from not just BMW in the early days, but then latterly Jaguar and also here, Ford. Once they became a part of the Tartar Empire towards the end of the 2000s, the 4.2 litre supercharged V8 was replaced with the 5 litre one. And that to many is the most desirable engine because it makes the best noise and is the fastest. But for me, it's this 4.4 litre twin turbo V8's combination of relatively decent economy, if needed it will do over 32 the gallon, along with the prodigious torque and it's just general refinement that I think makes it the best choice for this kind of car. Other notable features of this car, you've got heated and cooled seats, front and rear. You've got heated steering wheel, heated screens, front and rear. You've also got sat-nav, Bluetooth, multi-zone climate control, and the aforementioned settings for the all-wheel drive system. Though one thing I've never liked about the L322 is the fact that all of the buttons are sort of very um, chunky and kind of like my first car feeling. They just do not look anywhere near as nice as they should for what was a very, very expensive vehicle. Other nice touches include the fact you have a digital dash from an era where that was definitely not a normal thing and um, it works perfectly well, although it's also utterly pointless. Like all of the Land Rover Jaguar digital dashes after it, it just seems to want to replicate normal analog dials. It's pointless. The steering wheel feels as if it's come straight from Q Division on account of the fact it has an impossible number of buttons stuffed onto it. So you've got your settings for your stereo, you've got your controls for the digital dash, you've got your telephone switches, you've got cruise control, you've got the heated button, this car having radar guided cruise, there's also settings for the distance and honestly I'm amazed they even found the space for some paddles. Weirdly though, despite this lack of space, rather than put the horn in its traditional position, i.e. press the airbag, it's instead two little silver strips, one either side of it. It does work perfectly well, as it should in a Range Rover, because you need people to get out of your way, but um, it's just odd, put it that way. As a driving tool though, it's a very pleasant thing. As far as I'm concerned, the Range Rover USP has always been their ability to combine luxury with a car that's actually kinda decent when you're behind the wheel. So though the steering is a little light and a little slow, as it should be, and the air suspension can be a little bit floaty at times, in a bend, it's entertaining. Put your foot down, put it in sport mode when it stiffens up and it does do what it should. It's very exciting, it's very cool, and then when you've had your fun, you kind of relax, lay back, enjoy these leather seats with their uh, nice little captain's armrest over here, and you'll keep bumping into nice little Range Rover touches, like the twin glove boxes, the twin sun visors, and all that sort of good stuff. But I know what you're thinking, you're not just here for a Range Rover review. You've seen me drive these before, you've seen other people drive these before. You know they're generally well liked and mostly reliable, although sometimes can cost a fair bit. It's a Range Rover. You're here to know about its previous owner, and considering the fact it wasn't sold as being a royal car, you likely want to know how Ben worked that out. Well, it all began with a handle. Because this car comes in the lovely combination of green over tan with the nice specification, including the executive rear seating pack that gives you folding chairs in the back with lumbar support and the heating and cooling. This though isn't remarkable. What is unusual though, is that on the B pillar here, just behind me, you'll find a grab handle. And when he shared some pictures of this car on a few forums, a couple of people chimed in and said, ah, that's a royal car. It's only royal specification cars that got that handle in the back. No doubt designed to allow anybody, even perhaps say elderly ladies of a small stature, make sure they can get in and out of a car with dignity. 
to further aid ingress and egress, the car also has deployable side steps. In other words, the sort of barge board looking thing down here, when you unlock the car or open the door, it moves into position, allowing you to again step in without having to sort of stress yourself quite so much. Though curiously, we do believe that that was not actually there when this car was part of the Royal Fleet. Other things that did point towards this car's history included the registration, which having the OV prefix meant it was a car registered by the Land Rover factory, and that was the process for any cars used by the Royal Fleet. Now, it is no secret that both the British Royal Family and the government have been a very big customer of JLR for quite some time. In fact, the Prime Minister's car for a long time has been an armour-plated Jaguar XJ. What he's going to get next, I don't know probably a Kia Sportage or something. In any case, what this means is that without further supporting evidence, the simple presence of some door handles in the back is no guarantee that a car was used for anything particularly interesting or exciting. It was just a part of the Royal Fleet. However, according to those in the know, the colour combination is actually quite important. This gorgeous shade of Galway Green, which I think might be one of my favourite Range Rover Greens, over the beige and wood interior, was one used by Her Majesty. But despite knowing all of this, like myself, Ben remained sceptical, and so he set himself a task over the next few years of trying to find some sort of proof as to what exactly this car had done. And after a year of searching, he managed to find that picture, in which I was actually surprised to see that the car was still wearing the exact same registration. And if anything, what makes this car to me remarkable are some of the other things that it does not have. So you don't have soft closed doors, you don't have a stupid long wheelbase, the room in the back is okay, but it's not remarkable, certainly not compared to say a Rolls Royce. You also don't have any form of protection or armour plating. This is not ballistic glass, it's just normal double glazing stuff. And if someone were to throw a grenade at this, um, it'd hurt a lot. I suspect this means that the car was likely never used for going anywhere spicy, or perhaps the fact that um, there weren't really all that many people willing to take a pop at old Her Majesty herself. For those on the hunt for cars with genuinely unusual specifications, might I suggest you instead look for a car used by a politician? I cannot possibly think why, but it would appear that politicians are often in much greater need of armour plating than the royal family. Hmm, strange that. So then, what to think of this car? Well, on the one hand, you could say it's simply a very nicely specified old Range Rover. And yes, it once had a famous owner, but like Elton John's S600, the presence of a photo of somebody you've heard of getting into it doesn't really affect the value in any way, shape or form. Ordinarily, I'd agree with that sentiment. It's fairly common that you'll see a nice Ferrari or Lamborghini or something up for sale, and a big part of the advert is the fact that once upon a time, a rock star's name graced the V5. But the fact is, I've had a few awkward conversations with people where you say, um, yeah, so uh, this Lamborghini owned by uh, Ozzy Osbourne, is that uh, Ozzy Osbourne, the world-famous Lamborghini restorer and mechanic? Or Ozzy Osbourne, the man well-known for being so high that he bit the head off a bat not knowing what he was doing? And they sort of sheepishly go, um, yeah, the bat bitey one. And you go, yeah, because rock stars aren't exactly well-known for looking after stuff, are they? Just ask many a guitar. So in most cases, I think it really makes just about no difference whatsoever. Then you get cars where the owner really does make a difference. Case in point, Princess Diana's old Ford, which was remarkable for two reasons. First off, it was the only one of its type in black because the security services were getting fed up of her driving around in very, very visible cars. So that already made it noteworthy. And it was an example of a car that has been rapidly appreciating. And there are many photos of her driving it about. And although I didn't expect that car to fetch anywhere near as much as it did, 700 grand or something crazy, I could understand that it appealed to both Diana fans, you know, general royal collectors, and also petrol heads. So once you get a bunch of people together in an auction room, it's going to be an interesting day. As it happens, we don't have to wait long to see what the market thinks about this, because it will soon be going up for sale with Historics Auctioneers over at Bista. I'll put a link to that in the description down below, so if you're watching this before the auction, you can have a punt if you like, and if you're watching after, you can see just what it went for. 
I am told that an example of one of these in a similar specification with similar mileage, 123,000 in this case, would likely go for between 10 and 15,000 pounds. I really, really like it as a car, and at that price, I think it represents exceptional value for money. Green is certainly a color very much in vogue at the minute, and the Range Rover has always worn it well. Unfortunately, for whatever reason, the later fourth and fifth generation cars have become very, very boring in their color choices. You don't seem to see the same variety as you did with these older ones. But is it worth more than a standard one? Yeah. I think it probably is. That photo almost certainly has added to the value of it because that is proof of the provenance and proof really means everything when it comes to cars like this. The fact that it was also owned by somebody who is generally universally loved is, I think, pretty cool. And I could even imagine this car being bought by a rental or limo firm or wedding company who say, hey, do you want to be driven to your wedding in the Queen's Range Rover? There are people out there who are going to pay for that sort of thing. And honestly, this side of Mahatma Gandhi's Bentley blower, I'd struggle to think of a celebrity car that would actually interest me more than this. It's a cool thing. You know you speak to anybody about it and you say, oh yeah, this was the Queen's Range Rover, they'll want to know. And I suppose both the best and worst aspect of this car is that unless you told people what it had been used for and who'd sat in the back, they wouldn't really ever know. Meaning, you could have this car, you could drive it around doing that really, really blokey thing, going, yeah, you don't know how special this car is. Do you know it has been in the back? Oh, yeah, little Lizzie in the back, yeah. In my head, I'd love to open the service book and just see at the front it's stamped, you know, first owner, Mrs. Windsor of Horse Guards Parade. As it happens, we do know that this car spent some time in both Sandringham and up in the Balmoral area, and that we've worked out simply by the places that it has been worked on. So it's uh, been around a fair bit, and uh, if it could tell stories, you'd listen, wouldn't you? In any case, I think that's just about time for me to end mine, and I hope you've enjoyed today's video. I want to say a huge thank you to Ben for bringing out this lovely and rather interesting car, and as ever, to you for watching. Don't forget to hit the like button, comment down below, and subscribe if you haven't already. I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.